Hi, I'm Coach Corey Wayne, and today we're going to take a class on Did Atlantis Exist with our host, Professor Chunky. Hello, what's up? And Jade is also here, too. Jade is here, and she's got a magic trick. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> and Erica as well. Hey, guys. All right, so today we're going to be talking about Atlantis and, like, the legends of it. First, we're going to kind of start off with, like, the science side. Like, oh, could was there, like, a landmass actually here? We're going to kind of look at some of the theories, see, like, it, maybe it's, like, in the Azor Islands, maybe it's in the Sahara Desert. There's a whole bunch out there, and we're going to kind of narrow and whittle it down. And then eventually we're kind of going to go into the spiritual side. We're going to talk about a little Edgar Casey with it. I think that will get very interesting. And, and what um, Plato had to say as yeah, well. Yeah, we're starting with, so Plato's accounts of Atlantis are put into the T- Timaeus and Creatos. I'm kind of butchering the pronunciation, but look into it yourself. It's actually very fascinating. I pulled some quotes from that. So we're going to like start from like Plato's account of it and then work out where he could have mapped it out. And we're going to take it literally. A lot of people, the, one of the theories out there is all just like an analogy, basically essentially for like, oh, this civilization just got too um too too powerful very kind of corrupted and they cause their own downfall which is interesting because that's what the spiritual side has to say as well for like the atlantis falling but i once you actually look into some of the evidence it starts like oh it's not really as literal it's like they're saying it's just an allegory but i don't believe it was just an allegory i thought at the end of the day with atlantis there was always the myth of like in all the spiritual traditions have a flood some major flood event happened yeah and the legend was atlantis sank and then the people had to flee because it sank so we're going to start with plato's account of atlantis this power came forth out of the atlantic ocean for in those days the atlantic was navigable and there was an island situated in front of the strait, which are you, by you, called the Pillars of Hercules. And that, so the Pillars of Hercules is modern day the Straits of Gibraltar. We'll get into that a little later. The island was larger than Libya and Asia put together and was the way to the other islands. And from these you might pass to the whole of the opposite continent which surrounded the true ocean. For this sea, which is within the Straits of Hercules, is only a harbor. So he's referring to like the Mediterranean Sea where the Greeks kind of stayed. They thought that was like the big, huge sea. They didn't really have the knowledge of the mass, vast, actual ocean out there. And the surrounding land might be most truly called a boundless continent. Now in this island of Atlantis, there was a great and wonderful empire, which had ruled over the whole island and several others, and over parts of the continent and furthermore. The men of Atlantis had subjugated the parts of Libya within their columns of Hercules as far as Egypt and of Europe as far as Tyrrhenia. This vast power, gathered into one, endeavored to subdue a, at a blow our country and yours and the whole of the region within the straits. And then, Solon, your country shone forth. In the excellence of her virtue and strength among all mankind, she was preeminent in her courage and military skill and was the leader of the Hellions. And when the rest fell off from her, being compelled to stand alone after having undergone the very extremity of danger, she defeated and triumphed over the invaders and preserved from slavery those who were not yet subjugated and generously liberated all the rest who dwell within the pillars. But afterwards, there occurred violent earthquakes and a flood. And in a single day and night of misfortune, all your warlike men in a body sank into the earth, and the island of Atlantis in like manner disappeared in the depths of the sea, for which reason the sea in those parts is impassable and impenetrable, because there is a shoal of mud in the way, and this was caused by the subsidence of the island. Um, So I know there was a lot there, and you see how it says like two Solons. So um, So this is actually what the priestess said to Solon. Like what? This is the guy who was in Egypt and passed down the story to Plato. You can see there. So it was like he says, like in the thing, the west of the pillars of Hercules. So over here we have the pillars of Hercules and like modern day Strait of Gibraltar. If you just go west from that, you have this whole Azores Island like plateau and area, like at the Mid Atlantic Ridge. So this is, I guess, part of the account of Timaeus, twenty two C, twenty three B, and it's what the Egyptian priest said to Solon. So he says, quote, there have been and there will be again many destructions of mankind 
arising out of many causes. The greatest have been brought about by fire and water. The priest adds, you remember a single deluge only, but there were many previous ones. So it's, one of the things that's interesting when I see that is Edgar Casey talked about that the breakup of Atlantis was originally started and triggered by their misuse of their technology. And it caused the plates to shift and move, move around. And so there were several major catastrophes where part of the island broke apart, part of it sank, and then things were fine for years, and then more pieces would break off and sink. And so it was over like tens of thousands of years that, that yeah. he said, you know, the destruction happened. And so that's, you know, this account from Plato, this originally this, I guess, Egyptian priest, and that kind of confirms some of the things that Edgar Casey said yeah. about it. And it, didn't Edgar Casey, I believe, he also said the time of it? Like I think he said 11,600 11, years ago, like twelve thousand years. The final. Yeah, it, like the last piece of Atlantis, the last parts of the remnants of the yeah. original Atlantis finally sunk below the sea. You know, during you know Earth changes back then. You know. Yeah. So this is something that's always always gone on. I mean, there's there's places over in the mediterranean where there's just literally greek and roman cities that used to be above the water that just that part sank below the ocean just because the movement is of- interesting too because plato also dates the time of atlanta sinking eleven thousand six hundred years ago and the reason this is really interesting is because like i don't know how it is it could be a mere coincidence but at that same time there was sea levels rose over 400 feet because this was when the last ice age pretty much ended. It was like the younger driest catastrophe event, essentially. So, how did how did Plato know this happened eleven thousand six hundred years ago? How did he get the time right? And then also Edgar Casey as well too. Because it's interesting. Because when Edgar Casey was making these accounts, he didn't know Plato. He didn't read any of the Plato stuff about Atlantis, as well as we didn't have the ice core samples to know about this. Well, climate let me catastrophe. tell people what, who Edgar Casey was. So. Edgar Casey was known as a, they call him the sleeping prophet or America's sleeping prophet. And so in the early 1900s, he, um, he was having a problem. He was losing his voice and I'd been to all the doctors and specialists. And nobody could figure it They're like, there's nothing physically wrong with you. And so nobody could help him and he needed to be able to talk for a living, you know, to earn a living and, and do things he needed to do in life. And, one of the things that was happening back then was um, people doing like hypnosis and kind of laying down on a couch and going into a trance and hypnotizing people. And then you could ask them questions and they would give answers or have better accounts of things that had happened. And so he's like, oh, what the hell do I get to, you know, lose? Like, let's go. And so they go and the the person kind of puts them under and was able to help him and then so he got his voice back and then like it was but then two weeks later he lost again and he went back and so eventually he um he i guess his assistant and his wife learned how to take him through this and then um when he was under one time somebody asked a question about something in the room about somebody else and he says oh it was because of a past life and you know and and uh, an, you know ancient civilization like Egypt or Greece or something like that and and so eventually just by accident that you know he what happened what he was known for when he was in this trance like state people would say hey I got a tummy ache or I got this sore that won't heal and and he would be able to like diagnose them remotely and give them medical advice or like health advice and the stuff would work and so a lot of the things that he talked about about how the you know, people would ask him questions about how the body worked and how to be healthy. And he talked about the acid alkaline balance and how the foods you ate made it easy for your body to stay alkaline. And a lot of, and those principles line up with the stuff that Dr. Young discovered with the dark leafy greens, you know, the smoothies, the green juice, you know, all that stuff that everybody knows and loves and makes them feel better. And so most of his, the readings he did were like, there were like 10, I guess 14,000 different readings he did over his life. And they're mostly, you know, health 
And, um, but when he would be under, he would sometimes say, Oh, well, this injury was kind of karma or something that happened in uh, their past life in Egypt or Atlantis. And through the thousands of readings they did, lots of people had past lives in Atlantis and Lemuria. And so they would, when these would come out, they would ask him more questions and they would get a lot of information. And so, you know, I went in the nineties, I studied all this stuff and looked at all the, the accounts and the readings that he did where he, he mentioned people in their past lives in Atlantis. And it's interesting to hear those things and hear it line up with Plato and because he talked about the civilization, what it was like. They captured the um, energy from the sun and using some kind of crystal and were able to like beam it throughout the civilization and it would power their planes and their cars or their houses or, or whatever. But um, another interesting thing that he said was, I think he said in like 50, 50,000 BC, there was a, or maybe it was, there was a meeting in Atlantis about what to do about the hordes of giant beasts overrunning the earth. And so they decided they were going to use their technology to send these beams out to, I guess, wipe out the last remnants of some of the biggest, you know, predatory things, things that were still eating people like saber tooth tigers or whatever was still around you know big reptiles big animals yeah, and which is actually very interesting you just said that too because coinciding with the fall of, like in that catastrophe like all the, like the megafauna so, like the the mammoths the saber-toothed tigers the short-faced bear like if you just look back there was like crazy animals that roamed all over um they all got they all died out like 75 percent of them died out during this, during the catastrophe, yeah. so it kind of coincides with how oh we want got to get rid of all these massive creatures. So that was kind of like a misuse of technology because yeah. they were sending it out like everywhere, and it like destab. What Edgar Casey said was that it de destabilized the plates and caused earth changes and the breakup of their civilization. Um, I'm gonna put this on the video later, but if you guys want to look at this graph, actually, so this is a the. So the age we're in is the Holocene, and then before when this happened, it was still the Pleistocene. Like this major, the Younger Dryas boundary marks the start of a whole new age, essentially, in ge geological terms. So it was, it was a major event. And so in normal times, like 10% of species are always going extinct, just naturally. But if, when we're looking at this graph, you see a very, very sharp in, increase in the fossil record of species just getting wiped out and that also coincides with the temperature changes and, and when, the sea when was it when did that happen what was what was that time period where that you was like twelve thousand years ago to like eleven thousand six hundred oh. um i have because he also said they misuse their technology you know, for things like that to take care of these you know the giant beasts and then also they had you know I guess 100, 150,000 years prior had used it in warfare against each other and it, you know, destabilized the continents and caused them to break up parts sank, other parts that were on the ocean floor rose up. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing was he talked about there were like three great hall of records where the history of Atlantis and Lemuria and ancient man going back hundreds of thousands of years was put in three giant hall of records. One of them was, you know, at the you know, bottom of the Atlantic Ocean because it's in Atlantis and it's part of the land that sank. There's another one in uh, South America somewhere. It hasn't been discovered yet. It's like a pyramid-type complex that has, you know, another copy of these great hollow records. And then there's, a, he said there was another one on the right paw of the Sphinx. There's a chamber there that has the great hall of records. And he, what it was interesting is he said the souls, the entities that were the builders of the Great Hall of Records in previous lives would be the archaeologists and the scientists that would discover it and translate it and share humanity's history going back, you know, the Sphinx, Egypt, all that stuff. And, and the thing that's very interesting about the right Paul the Sphinx, because at the time he said it, like, they, there was no, no idea, no one... But it was like in the 90s, this Japanese um, 
geological team, they did like sonar ground waves and they actually detected, oh, there is actually a chamber, but right where Edgar Casey said it, when he said it in, I think it's sometime in the early thirties. Um, and then it actually came true. It actually plays into another thing that he got right with the Bimini road. He kind of, he said it would be discovered in like 68 or well, actually 68 or 69, not so far And then it was discovered in 1968. Which is very interesting that he got. Even you know, let me just the coincidence. It's just like the coincidences keep adding, adding up, and it's harder to just. It's it's a less logical and harder argument to make that they're all just coincidences instead of oh wait this actually might be something. That's not the Bimini Road. Mm-mm. That's just a bunch of blocks. Yeah, I tried. It, it was. Like there's not a lot of pictures. Artificial. Yeah, they, what it's, they what it looks pictures. like is it looks like a bunch of stones. Like giant stones that had been laid, it was kind of like the way, the type of roads that the Romans built. Yeah, those and so you had descendants in the ancient world. That's why so many of the stone things were so big, so heavy in the ancient world because yeah. they were all descendants. But you know, over time, all that knowledge got lost. I like how actually we're doing the flow of this. Um, I think we're jumping into the theoretical side, but I think there's a lot of evidence that backs it up, and it's always kind of fun to theorize and talk like what could have happened. Um, so I guess we'll go more with Edgar Casey, and it's just like what Corey was saying earlier about like the similarities of the pyramids, especially between like Mesoamerican civilizations and the Egyptians. Because um, that's where he said they really, um, they fled to after. In the ancient past, the, the continent of Atlantis was there. Yeah, it makes it very easy to island. Remember how they said that it was very easy to island hop and actually traverse the ocean in Plato's account? It makes it way easier with the islands because uh, like their boats at the time couldn't go far away from shore. This is how they were built. They just weren't they weren't they made they weren't for designed that. For they, it. they were like shallow shallow bottom type. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Type of uh, they weren't gonna go sail for months at a time. So this is interesting. This was part more things. Uh, on Atlantis, Lemuria, that civilization, according to Casey, says Atlantis suffered from a division amongst its people. The children of the Law of One, a faction who wanted to spiritually safeguard the land based on natural laws, and the Sons of Belial, a faction that wanted to exploit natural resources for material gain. Central to the conflict... Sounds like what's going on today. Central to the conflict was a third class of unenlightened and inferior humans who the sons of Belial exploited as slave labor. While the children of the law of one wanted to raise their consciousness, the sons of Belial wanted to keep them ignorant and exploit them for gain. So this actually, it does get interesting too, especially you kind of like look at some myths and stuff. Say if we go back to like the ancient like Sumerian myths and stuff, we'll say like the Anaki essentially, like they were the gods here and then they kind of created human beings to uh, as slave labor and stuff. And then, okay, now let's actually switch back to, if you actually get into like some of the UFO, this in oh, occultism and spiritual Sitchin stuff, stuff, this is kind of something that's the always Sumerian been happening. Sumerian tablets that yeah. talk about humanity was kind of seeded by alien races and genetically altered or were basically their experiment. Which is interesting too, because in all the mythology, there's like like human... Well, you Human see, like, UFOs and some lot. of the, yeah, the, the, the hieroglyph, hieroglyphics, you see what looks like UFOs. The Mayas, the Incas, all of yeah. them. Or there's also that hieroglyph where it has, like, the, it literally looks like just, like, an electra, like, a light bulb, essentially. Because it's also interesting, like, in the pyramids, you ever think about it? Like, how do they see? It's just a dark tunnel. How did they see in the pyramids? What did they use? Fire. There's no soot patterns. And there's no torch holders anywhere in the whole thing. They well, on the walls, it. you saw... There the, would be soot. The, the walls, there's a Oil. picture that looks like a giant light bulb. Yeah. You know, like those the long tubular ones that have the filament. There's a thing in the wall that looks like it's got a, a holder. For like a I'm lantern. I'm sure you can probably pull it up. Yeah. And so it looks like they had light bulbs like, to oh, light well, the inside of it. There you go. A light bulb-like device. Or a lantern. Dropped it down. You you were I'm you had it so up on convinced. screen a couple weeks ago. <laughs> I'm yeah. all about the aliens. Yeah, there it is. Oh, he's got a big light there. Yeah, he's got something oh, big. 
song? Uh, that. It looks like a <laughs> it looks like a light bulb, and it's like I a wire attached to something. I'm pretty sure that's like that lady likes it. Multiple Don't. inundations, multiple cataclysms, and so each time you know you're getting more and more people scattering, and you're losing more and more of their technology and their knowledge yeah. and their history of what happened, especially if stuff is suddenly sinking. You don't have time to take stuff with you. You lose everything. I think when we were going over the Plato thing, actually, the Egyptian that's priest so said crazy. that. It's like, you guys didn't write this stuff down. There's no history of it. It's just been forgotten. And that's the thing I brought up with, like, the collective amnesia. We're all just, we all kind of just forget about this because it's a scary thought that we can just get wiped out. And they're, you know? Well, and when they moved, they probably had not the same supplies as they had as when where they were at home. Yeah. So when they moved somewhere else, they can't rebuild of what they created before. Yeah, they don't, they don't have, have like the manpower. The same to, tools. To, to or, yeah, exactly. So Casey indicated Atlantis had developed advanced technologies and was roughly the size of Europe. He described how the Atlanteans used crystals and sound waves for healing, had elevators and connecting tunnels powered by compressed air and steam, and had developed a quartz crystal science to mine precious metals. Casey claimed Atlanteans had discovered the amplification power of crystals for use in laser technology and memory chips and had extensive abilities in mental telepathy, psychokinesis, and astral projection into fourth dimensional consciousness. It was a big focus in their civilization on spirituality. But part of what he also talked about is once like humans or there's our the spiritual beings that we are started having human experiences is that we kind of got lost in material matter because the the molecules and the matter that make up our world are moving very slow and so over time we lose our connecting link and lose our awareness of our divinity and it's kind of like the fall of man where man was an, an angel and or the angels kind of fell we became lost in the physical three-dimensional world and over the centuries eventually lost our connecting link to each other and then so that's where all the polarity stuff comes in where people started seeing themselves as separate from each other and then war develops all of these things it's pretty fascinating the spiritual side is interesting how especially like the laser technology and the memory chips it makes sense. Like, if we experienced what they experienced, there'd be no trace of our civilization in 10,000 years. Well, everything would, you know, even big concrete buildings eventually would fall apart and vegetation and st stuff over the centuries would eventually cover it up, just yeah. like the pyramids and stuff in South America that got grown over in oh, just yeah. a few hundred oh. years and were totally covered up. There's so many in the Amazon rainforest they're finding now because, like, that radar technology, well, there's just massive things there. So there's a lot of, like, hidden history we just don't know, you know? It's kind of suppressed. Well, I think it's really interesting that they have incorporated, like, quartz crystal and precious metals into yeah. what they are doing. And also, quartz like, crystal the laser is used in uh, solar panels. It's a crystal, right? Well, like, quartz is something also that, like, we use for, like chakra and like healing so i think that is yes our quartz is used for solar panels ah uh, see look at that makes you wonder edgar casey knew about solar energy before it was ever invented so that's interesting it's that, used for a so lot it's of like stuff things. like that stuff like the acid alkaline balanced i mean there were thousands of cases of people following his readings and 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 getting better and getting healthier and so it's like when you see like a track record of the dude was right. And then, you know, when you're trying to piece together history and where we come from and it's like it helps. And he was a, a Christian minister as well. He was very religious and he struggled with his gift and wondered where it, it came from at, at times. But um, it helps kind of tie everything together. The ancient world, the myths that, you know, at least me, I grew up and these things were all myths. Now you can, 
you you would occasionally see a documentary on Atlantis or whatever, and that'd be it. There's like no encyclopedia. Maybe you go to the library and there might be ten or fifteen books there on the topic. But now with the internet, it's like there's and then you see people go on like Joe Rogan, like that one guy. Yeah, Rizzle Carl. Oh, I forgot to mention that. A huge, huge help. You must check him out yourself is Randall Carlson. He's great, especially for all the geological things. He's where I got, I learned like a a lot of the stuff. He's great. Because he's matched up the geologic record with seeing changes that happen throughout history, right? He's the guy who had that video with the cataclysms. Um, So this kind of goes back to how they had the quartz crystal, which is interesting. And then also the Egyptians say, oh, yeah, we're, we're, the Atlanteans fled here. Like that's in the, the priest. That's what's taught to them. And then it's interesting, too, if they're so good at making the quartz and the stones and this advanced technology, it really makes sense who made all the, the Sphinx and the Great Pyramids and stuff and all the, the granite of structures. Atlantis. Yeah. And so the pharaohs that came later, probably uh, maybe they didn't know this yeah. stuff or it wasn't common knowledge and so they started taking these pyramids and other things and turning them into burial chambers probably closing passages up and stuff because the interesting thing is like when you like the kings and the queen's chamber they have tunnels that would go out to the surface and would line up with different constellations yeah and certain times of the year um they would line up and I can't remember who it was theorized or um, like the pyramids were kind of like a purification thing for like religious rituals that would like purify your spirit and your physical body, it, you know, going into the pyramid and at different places in it. And they perform rituals and things there. But later on, the pharaohs and people that came after that used it for their own purposes. So something I forgot to mention earlier was that this Edgar Casey said also in the readings when people are like, well, where's where are you getting all this? Where's the information coming from? And he, you know, in the trance-like state while he was under, he said it was coming from the Akashic records, and so it was like the universe's record of every single event that's ever happened, every flutter of a butterfly's wing, every life you've ever had, everything you've ever said. It's like It's all recorded. And so when he would be talking or doing a reading on a person, he'd be able to look back and pull the, you know, that or channel that information, whatever you want to call it, from the Akashic records and speak on things that maybe had happened in in that person's past lives that were affecting them, that, you know, things you did or maybe negative things you did to other people in a past life, this life you'd be incarnated with them as a chance to potentially heal those relationships. In one lifetime, you might be the father, and the next lifetime, you might be the son. And um, and the the soul's not gender-specific. One life, you might be a woman. Another life, you might be a man. And one of the interesting things he said is that if you're a woman in one life, and then you reincarnate too soon without getting back to balancing the essence of your spirit that you have too much of the original essence. So if you're a woman and now you're a man the next life, that you'll still have the same sexual attraction as a, as a woman would. So in other words, but souls and enti- entities would choose that. They would choose to be gay or lesbian, especially if they had been abusive towards those people. And then their part of balancing the soul was like, if you do bad things in a future life, you'll experience what it's like to be the receiver of those bad things and then so that's the way the soul through its lives balances itself out it gets back to a state of oneness and gratitude and connectedness and sometimes people choose lives that are very noble and they suffer because they're a brave spirit and so their overcoming of their suffering is helpful for humanity or other people that are suffering so it's Because, you know, we choose our parents. We choose our life paths, our life experiences to help heal things we did in a previous life or have experiences together where we may have done bad things to each other, but in in the next life you have a chance to love one another and heal that soul type of relationship. So it's basically you got the esoteric thing, especially like Edgar Casey, and then we're trying to line that up with actual 
physical evidence or historical yeah. evidence, scientific evidence. Yeah. Well, yeah. So perfect. I love that explanation of it. So we already know that the sea, so sea levels rose 400 feet because of the melting of those ice sheets. And we have just, the, that's just massive. Like just how much of the actual mass is being taken up. And it was miles thick too. Right. So um, we have the records of it. It's a great place to look at it is the channeled scab lands where it just a mass, a mass remnants and scars of a great deluge. And a deluge is like a great flood essentially. Um, this is from J. Harlan Bretz. I could conceive of no geological process of erosion to make this topography except huge, violent rivers of glacial meltwater. It was a debacle which swept the Columbian Plateau. So it's actually happened in a very like fast period. The whole that's the interesting thing about the Younger Dryas thing. There's still theories proposed, maybe with a comet, an asteroid, something. But it's cool. What we were talking about earlier with the Edgar Casey kind of the electronic beam. If it like kind of just burned everything, it kind of makes sense if, say, just that was the cause for all the ice being melted so rapidly. If it was not an asteroid or something. So I think that's an interesting theory, but it's kind of hard to, to prove and talk about that. Here's just a picture of the vast scale of the thing. Like, you know, when you're kind of at a beach and you see like water coming down and it has that erosion pattern. Mm hmm. Um, this is just on such a massive scale. It's really interesting too, because now we have to get into a kind of a debate that's ongoing between like the, the gradual, like con conformist where the earth's gradually just changing and the catastrophist where it's like for most of the time, the earth is just, it's always gradually kind of slowly changing, but the bit, there's big events that happen that do the most change. Uh, that form masses like this. Like this wasn't drawn out over millions of years to create this. It actually happened rel in geological terms in a short period of time. So, which I think makes way more sense instead of the gradualistic thing. Because especially in the 50s, the reason this kind of happened was they wanted to move away from like the Bible catastrophe stuff. Oh, great flood. They were like, oh no, we're very scientific now. So we're not going to, Oh, there was no catastrophes. We haven't seen any events. Their their whole notion idea was, oh, we haven't seen anything that happened in our lifetime, so this couldn't happen. It's a ridiculous argument. Just because you've never observed it doesn't mean it can't happen. And it's also they're like, oh, scale, stuff scaled that up can't happen. And that's one of the things about the Great Flood. They're like, oh, that's just every individual culture talking about their own flood thing. It's not just one massive flood, but through all the myths and traditions that are passed down, they always tell of this. And plus it's carved into some of these yeah. different complexes in the ancient world. The pyramid-like structures, you see people fleeing in boats from a, a great flood. Yeah, myth is actually really, really interesting because it's how mm. our history has been passed down. And we almost live in like this like collective state of amnesia where we just forget about all this. It's very... Going back to the Egyptian priestess quote, like we only, we only remember one deluge, but there's been many destructions of mankind. We're in this just collective amnesia where we don't remember it. Mankind. <laughs> mankind, yes. <laughs> so I find that very fascinating. So now um, the reason I was talking about the glaciers is because they also not only the melting of them raises the sea level, but the weight of them on just pushes the continent down and kind of think of um, the earth like a water balloon. So if you're squeezing a water balloon, it's going to bulge out in certain areas to compensate and keep it ready. So when that pressure is gone, it's going to return back to normal, okay? And um, so the, the ascenosphere is the thing under the lithosphere, which is kind of where our crust is on. Like the crust is very solid, doesn't really move around a lot. But the athenosphere is, um, it's like plasticky, actually. It's like just melt. So it's very, very movable. Very movable. That's how like plate tectonics work. You've, you've induced perverted thoughts <laughs> in Erica's mind when you start talking about the balloon. Um, so the athenosphere is like very plasticky, and that's how plate tectonics and all that stuff moves. So if we're talking about a great weight of all these glaciers just coming off, you're going to see movement in the athenosphere. Mm -hmm. And we're... There's also the isostatic rebound, like the landmass shooting back up. Like the whole Cana a lot of Canada, especially the Hudson Bay area, you can see the beaches. I'll put the picture up now so you can see. But the beaches go 
right because the land's just rising up that's like the shorelines so that's just look it's just getting farther and farther away because the land's coming back up so um the reason i bring this up so with the balloon thing where is it? it's going to go back to the place of like the least resistance essentially and what areas would have least resistance places where a lot of plates intersect and where the plates meet and it so happens, this is why I really think the, Az the Azores Islands and that whole plateau is where Atlantis was, because Plato's account, as well as, so it's a triple plate junction between the African plate, the North American plate, and the Eurasian plate. So it's like very active, it's a very pliable area. So it's, e it's easy just for that movement to happen. So not only like did like sea levels rise, but the land also sunk down. Because it was the North American plate was essentially rebounding, going back up because it yeah. lost all the weight. He said, "I think it was the islands of Bimini were the mountaintops of Atlantis." See, I think Bimini was like just like a colony. I think um, my perception of Atlantis was obviously like meaning it was at one time thousands of feet in the yeah. air, and that's what had. Because the rest of it is totally submerged. I would imagine it's probably buried in yeah. silt and all this other crap. Yeah. Over so that's there. the thing that's interesting. Thousands of years. In, um, actually, they've taken seafloor samples of, say, the, like the Azores Islands and stuff that's like hundreds of feet. Actually, I think thousands of feet underwater. They're finding like fine beach sand, um, shallow like reef, shallow water corals and organisms hundreds of meters away. The beach sands 300 miles from the nearest like land yeah it's very mm -hmm. interesting that those samples i believe this is 1954 um atlantis was, was big it took the whole thing up there the mid it's like exploring the mid-atlantic from what casey it's, said so this is the modern day seafloor mm -hmm. but you can see and then you could literally see the the plate junction going in the middle of it where it's just very pliable like it's not going to happen in the middle of the united states because the land there is already so it's in the middle of the plate it's so strong it's going to go in the weakest area. So that explains how, why it sunk down so much, which I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing was, I mean, the Egyptians are well known for this because the problem with their big dating method is, oh, what pharaoh scribed on when, who made this? But this is well known that the Egyptian pharaohs literally just stole everybody's work. Like the pharaohs are like, oh, I'm just going to rewrite on the hieroglyphs. Um, it's really a weird, yeah, they strange... They supposedly weren't the... I think it was Casey said that they weren't the ones that... The Egyptians weren't the ones that originally built the pyramids and the Sphinx and all that. It was the, I guess, the descendants of the Atlanteans because of they wanted to preserve the knowledge of the ancient world and they put it in the three places. One where it's sunk, another one that's been grown over vegetation somewhere in South America, and then the one at the Sphinx. So this is the thing that's interesting. Um, so we think of like our, we, we kind of went from like hunter gatherers and we slowly evolved in this straight just pattern to where we are modern day. But looking at all these ancient sites in Puma Egypt, Punku. Puma Punku, um, Puma Punku, Puma Punku, um, it's a very strange phenomenon that the more advanced, um, and these like H. Uh, shaped things when I guess they said one of the documentaries I saw the scientists that um, analyzed the stone said it, it the molecules looked like it had been melted down and poured into a mold yeah so it's very interesting with all these sites that the more advanced forms of craftsmanship are farther back in time and the more the closer we get to our modern day the more rudimentary it gets because these things are huge and they're incredibly yeah. heavy they're, they weigh thousands and thousands of pounds and it just kind of looks like a, a construction site Several. that just got wiped they were mid-construction doing something and the civilization just got wiped out yeah um puma puma was interesting we spent a lot of time on that one but this phenomenon of of just the better more advanced tech basically building techniques and methods, doing s structures that are, say, like a thousand tons, just a whole orders of magnitude better. And now when they try and recreate it, they can't. Like, say, a good, with Edgar Casey saying the Egyptians kind of inherited the stuff, it kind of makes sense because if you ever actually see when the Egyptian pharaohs try to recreate the pyramid, they make their own pyramids, mm. 
they try to make their own pyramids supposedly when they're farther like thousands of years from the original ones mm-hmm. they made it out of mud bricks and it's just terrible it doesn't actually come together yeah because i remember growing up the scientists theorized that those different pyramid structures were their attempts to make a pyramid and then the the Giza and the rest of them were that's what they built once they figured out how to do it mm-hmm. but it's i've never heard that before that's interesting that the pyramids were built and then the other ones that are the stepped pyramid the ones that are kind of messed up or were actually made after the, the Giza yeah. ones also another interesting thing is um so if you look at some of the pyramid, um, some of the like just the structures, you'll see they um, on the older ones, it's just a solid one piece of granite. It's very linear. It's the same thing. And then the newer structures, it was made out of round blocks of sandstone stacked on top of each other. Just a more it's a weaker material. Like how are they doing harder materials like granite, way better cutting? before and when they try and redo the things it just doesn't come out as well like there's a lost trade or technology there which is interesting civilizations that built that there's a lost art he Um, also said that at some point in the future the atlantis would rise above and then eventually that hall of records that was there would be discovered 